at the age of about six or seven, I started smoking my first uh, cigarette that led to marijuana and then formed a gang of 20 boys. And, uh, and then we started, you know, naming ourselves as the Black Shadows. Now, the name of my gang was called the Black Shadows. That's why my book is called Out of the Black Shadows. I don't think we have the copies now, eh? We ran out of the copies. <coughs> but nobody ever met with the black shadows in the streets, walked away alive. It was dangerous to meet with this gang in the streets. My knife, which I had named the, the dragon, each mark on that knife told you how many times I had disturbed someone. My two revolvers, I was in control of the streets. Even my gang of 40 boys, I told them, you never laugh in my presence. So I was a serious boy, never laughed in my time. The only time I left, I laughed. I was 20 years old the night I came to know Jesus. That's the time I laughed for the first time. And I remember one of my gangs laughing, going around the corner. I followed him. Why are you laughing? Said I was laughing about. And I pulled out my gun, shot him on his thigh. I said, you never laugh in my presence. So I was that boy was cruel. And, uh, and, uh, and nobody could mention the name of Jesus. Mentioning the name of Jesus in my presence, you are signing a death sentence for yourself. Because Jesus to me was a white man's God. And I couldn't believe in Jesus. The Bible was a book of slavery brought by the white man to brainwash the black people and make them slaves. So there was no way I could believe in this book. One girl came to share a testimony with me, said, brother, I want to tell you about Jesus. And I was quiet. I said, I want to tell you. And I pulled out my knife and stepped on her back as I was about continuing. My friend, my friend said, Steve, don't do that. I turned towards my friend and shot him on his leg. Said, you never tell me to stop. And so I was, that boy was cruel, and I was looking for my father. The day I would have seen my father, I would have kill him, killed him. If I had seen my mother, I would have killed her. I said, why did they bring me in this world to suffer like this? So I was unpredictable among my friends. And then later on, uh, <clears throat> later on then, I saw... Uh, they were joining the freedom fighters under Mugabe. At the age of 15, I joined the freedom fighters in the bush. So in the bush, we had to say, there's no God, there's no God. Communism is good. Communism is good. And I embraced the Marxist ideology with passion. And I vowed in the bush that you drill trains, you drill uh, plant landmines, mines, and so on. And then I said, any white man has to die. You only greet a white man when you kill him first, then greet him later. Because a talking white man will make you a slave. So kill him first, then greet him later. So I had that hatred against the white man, and I could, each time I saw a white man, I could shiver just wanting to kill him. And so one day when I was 20 years old, I was given a bomb to go and plant it at a bank where many white people used to go that on Monday morning, the bomb would explode at quarter past eight. So I was excited that many white people are going to die. You are safe tonight, don't worry. <laughs> <coughs> <I could laughs> you know, when white people are tense, they become red, red, red. <laughs> And black people will become pitch black. <laughs> and so as I was going to plant that bomb that evening with my 20 boys, heavily armed, hand grenades, and so on, and as we were going to that tent, we saw this big, massive tent from South Africa. And I said, guys, they are preaching about Jesus there. I hit this name. So before we get to the bank, let's go and surround this big tent. There were about two to 3,000 people inside. And I said, again, it's coming from South Africa. It's a taboo. 
I hate South Africa because of the apartheid system. So, as we went to the tent, I said, surround the tent in twos. At seven o'clock on sharp, when I blow the whistle, throw the hand grenades inside, get your AK-47, spread the bullets to everyone. If one person escapes, I'll give you a bullet myself. They say, okay, Steve, we'll do that. As they were about to go around the tent, one guy said, Steve, it's five to seven. What do we do in five minutes? I said, well, since we've got five minutes, let's go inside for two minutes only to look at the people about to kill. Then when we see them, we go out and kill them. Just two minutes. I said, okay, now if you good, <laughs> give God two minutes, that's enough. <laughs> so we went inside and they were singing choruses, praising God, but my gang at the back, we started singing out of tune to disturb the meeting and one of the preachers came and touched my shoulder and said, boys, please keep quiet. And I pulled out my knife and said, preacher, if you ever touch me again, I will kill you. And all my gang members looked at me and said, what? I said, why are you looking at me? He said, you have just warned that preacher. Because I was not that character. When I pulled out my knife, I would use it. When I took out my gun, I would shoot. But they were shocked that I warned this preacher. And then he left, and then I started tossing my knife up and down. And then suddenly, they invited a pretty girl from Soweto in Johannesburg. She was gorgeous. She put me off balance. <laughs> and I couldn't figure out what, why, how a pretty girl becoming a Christian. Because in my understanding, I use Christian. You think Christianity is for old, old people who are about to die. They are useless, so they needed to be Christian. Or maybe ugly girls with wrong figures and wrong nose. And boyfriends don't love them anymore, so they go to be Christians. But the more she shared the testimony, she was shining with the glory of God around her as if there were bulbs and she was shining. And I said, hey, guys, you see that girl shining? And I said to my friend on my right, you see that girl shining? He said, no, she's not shining. And then my friend on my left said, you see that girl shining? He said, no, she's not shining. I said, what type of eyes do you have, you guys? Can't you see she's shining? And my friends could see that glory. And then the more she shared the testimony, she was so bright that I had to do like this as she was talking. And then suddenly she invited another black evangelist from Soweto. This man stood up and read two scriptures, Romans 6 verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is the eternal life through Jesus. And then he read 2 Corinthians, chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich for your sakes, he became poor, that through his poverty you may be rich in Christ. Then he kept quiet after reading the scriptures. He started crying. Then I said, now, this is a second confusion. I've never seen a preacher after reading the scripture, he starts by crying. Why is he crying? And for what seemed like five minutes. And then he said, I am crying because the spirit of God is telling my spirit that many people seated here tonight are going to die. I said, oh, oh guys, get ready. <laughs> <coughs> you, hear, we, we hear, you hear what that preacher is saying? So I took one of my guns from the back. I tucked here in front. We started making our hand grenades ready to explode. I said, get ready. And then he starts preaching that tonight I'm going to talk about God's transaction. If you surrender your life to Jesus, in one package, in return, he's going to give you four things. Now I said, what are those four things? He said, number one, your sins will be forgiven. They will be wiped out by the blood of Jesus. Number two, you have joy. The world can never give you that type of joy. Number three, you have got that tranquility, that peace in your life. And number four, your name will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. In my mind, I said, whoa, that's a good deal. If, 
if I give him one, he gives me four. Okay, that's a good deal. So I'm thinking, I said, all right. And then, then one of my friends said, oh, Steve, it's time up, two minutes. I said, no, another two minutes. And then this preacher started sh sharing. This is how Jesus demonstrated that transaction. While he was in his mother's womb, he was rejected. And I said, yes, I can identify with that Jesus. Born in a manger where it was stinking, I said, yes. Here I sleep under a bridge. Jesus born in a stinking place. He had a, a donkey, a borrowed donkey. He had a borrowed house for his last supper. He had a borrowed cross where he was crucified. That cross did not belong to Jesus. It belonged to Barabbas. And when he died on the cross, he was buried in a borrowed grave. I said, how can the son of God, everything borrowed for my sake, and he said he went to heaven, but one day is coming again. But when he comes, it will be the God of judgment. That's the part of the message I didn't like. Because when he preached about the judgment of God, I didn't like his finger. Every time he pointed that finger like he was pointing at me. And he would point this direction like the finger was bending towards me. And he would point this way like the finger was bending towards me. So I pulled out my knife about to kill my friend, I said, I'll kill you. How can you go and tell the preacher about my sins? And my friend took out his knife and said, I'll also kill you. You told him about mine too. So we faced each other with our knives, then with our knives on our cheeks, but that finger made me restless. So I said, oh, he thinks he's more clever. I'm more clever than him. So when you do like this, I would duck down behind someone's back. <laughs> and then when the finger comes, I would duck. So I was going up and down, up and down. But little did I know that you can never hide from the finger of God. I broke down in tears that night. I was crying like a little child, broken before God, under deep conviction of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God was following me like where uh, David was. There is yet one boy. There is yet one boy. A nobody. A nobody. No qualifications. No education. Yet one boy. And heaven said, we will wait for that boy. And as I was walking forward crying, the smell of my body, I was stinking. Never had shoes in my life. I was horrible. Never had a bath for almost six months. I was horrible, stinking. Some of you look at yourselves. Man, God has blessed you. Good parents, good homes. But for some of us, when we say, I know where I'm coming from. I know who I am today. And I know where I'm going. My brothers, some of you, you forget where you are coming from. And so there... As I came forward and knelt and grabbed the feet of that preacher, his trousers were soaked wet with my tears that night. But he didn't stop preaching. There are some people who wait, oh, well, those who want Jesus come forward or stand up. For me, I walked forward while he was still preaching. I was on my knees there crying for mercy from God. And as he was winding up his message, another rival gang came, threw the bombs into that tent, blew up that tent. Many, many people died that night, including my three gang members. Just as he had said in the beginning, I am crying because I, God is telling men I go to die. There were dead bodies all over. Every car outside was set ablaze you could hear explosions of tires and so on. And I was the only boy who remained behind that night. Only one single boy. And I remember when I was talking with this preacher, I said, can you Jesus save a sinner like me? And, you know, he was holding his handkerchief on his nose because of the smell of my body. And I was saying to myself, even this preacher, 
can smell my body. But he talked to me with his handkerchief. And then he says, yes, God loves you, young man. And I pulled out my gun on his forehead, shaking as a preacher. I'll kill you right now. Don't tell me about God. I want you a Jesus. You've been preaching about. For me, I thought God and Jesus were different. So this person started crying. As I told him my story, I live under a bridge and so on. He started crying. He said, young boy, a 14-year-old girl in Soweto was raped with a knife on, his, on her neck, raped several times, left for dead, and she became pregnant and gave birth nine months later. In the public toilet, she gave birth, she took that baby, forced the baby, still with the umbilical cord, in the toilet, ran away. Another woman was going to help us, found a baby, pulled out that baby, rushed to the hospital, the baby survived. He said, that baby is me. And it was that preacher that night. I saw his life and my life were identical. So he read me Psalms 27. Though my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. I am what I am today, brothers. <laughs> Hallelujah. I am what I am by the grace of God. Just the grace of God. Some of you boast about education. You boast about everything. But for me, there's nothing I can boast about except the cross of Jesus. Nothing else. And then that night, I want to close now. Don't worry, in Africa we close many times. <coughs> but this is Stellenbosch closing. <laughs> and so in the, I went to the bridge after Jesus had come into my life. I fell from the top of my head. I was so clean inside. Although the body, my hair was full of lies, stinking, but inside, the glory of God came inside. Ma, I was crying for the first time, tears of joy. Ma, have you ever experienced that joy, that peace, that peace that makes you unstoppable because you have found the one who is invisible, the king of glory. And then I went under my bridge, I knelt down, I said, God, I don't, I'm not educated, I don't know how to read, I don't know how to write. God, here I am, I don't know what to do with my life. And the spirit of God came upon me. I don't know what language I was talking, it was glorious. And an audible voice behind me said, Stephen, I will open your eyes and send you to many nations you do not know. And I slept. First time I slept without nightmares for the first time. I slept like a baby. Morning I woke up. The same place I've been from the age of six to 20. The same place. And I saw the trees looked brand new. I said, why couldn't I see these trees before? So I went to one tree and I hugged one tree. I said, Lord, if you are here, I could have hugged you like this to tell you how much I love you, how much I love you, Jesus. And the Spirit of God touched me again. I was just lying prostrate down there. And the Lord said, go to the police and surrender yourself. I said, God, they are going to hang me. He said, I will be with you. And I got in the first bus I couldn't contain myself. I stood up in the bus with my stinking. And then he says, ladies and gentlemen, last night Jesus came into my heart. I was bubbling with joy. One man, he said, you shut up. We don't preach on Mondays. He pushed me out of the bus. <laughs> and so I go to the next bus. I said, I will tell the driver. As I was going, I said, driver, last night Jesus came into my heart. My sins are forgiven. I was bubbling with joy. Many people started crying in the bus. One woman said, young boy, what must we do? I said, well, I really don't know. <laughs> I was less, less than 24 hours in the Lord. So when we got downtown, I forced all the people who were crying in the bus. I said, kneel down. I said, you mean while people are walking to? I said, yes, I did it last night. So I forced them to kneel down. They were repenting, confessing their sins, accepted Jesus as their personal savior. I was less than 24 hours in Jesus. And they, I led these seven people to Christ. Three are full-time pastors. <laughs> Praise his name. Glory to 
I want to close. And I went to the police after eight hours. They say, if your Jesus is forgiven you, we forgive you too. The Bible says, if the Son of Man shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. And I was free. Heaven had forgiven me, and the government had forgiven me. So they gave me money. Thank you very much. They gave me money to buy myself a Bible, and I bought myself a Shona Bible, which I didn't know how to read. But one thing I enjoyed was I heard the word of God. I started just flipping the pages. I said, oh, the day I will read this book, I will read it and read it and read it. And so this is the best novel ever, the best book ever. It's a love letter from God. And I love reading it. And I read every day four chapters. Every day four chapters. And I'm disciplined, studying the word of God. But at age, age 22, that's when the first time under a bush, God opened my eyes. No education, but under that bush, God opened my eyes to read his book. And the first verse was 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14. That was my first verse. For the love of Jesus constrains us. Man, what a glorious moment. I was like a mad person. Then a year later, a white missionary, an Africana, a Mr. Jubel. Oh, my, a real Africana uh, took me in his home. In spite of the laws of the government that time, no black people could stay in the white area. He took me, stayed with me in the white area. First day, he gave me the first bath of my life. You should have seen the color of water that day. And all the lies floating on the water. That was me. And he shaved my hair, bought some chemicals, bought me first pair of shoes. He bought me a little bit of oversized because my feet were like a duck. They've never been in shoes before. So that first day I was walking like a robot, you know. Oh, man. But, you know, God started taking me, picking me up, and cleansing me. And, and then later on, two years later, a British young guy by the name Patrick Johnson took over. For 15 years, I stayed with this British guy. And every day he was trying to teach me how to hold a pen. And I struggled how they hold a pen. So I've got my own way I hold a pen. Because it was so difficult to learn at the age of 22. And then it was through this white man, God started helping me. But, listen to this. But, five years with this white man, every day, we went out to preach outside there. Many people came to Jesus. But during the night, I wanted to kill him. My past was still haunting me. Brothers and sisters, you can come to Jesus, but if you don't deal with the negative things of your past, they will haunt you. They will haunt you. Maybe you are raped or you had sex before outside marriage. That thing haunts you. You need to bring that at the foot of cross of Jesus Christ to deal with that past in your life. Are we together? And so when you deal with that, my brother, you fly like an eagle. My life was, yes, I couldn't move forward because every night I wanted to kill this white missionary. Until one day I got tired. I said, God, five years of this household, if remaining, God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. And uh, God dealt with me through that. And then I had to go to this white man, brother, I wanted to kill you for five years. Oh, he was really red. But we hugged each, each, <coughs> hugged each other, forgave each other. And, but God, he had to test me on that forgiveness. I was in Pretoria asking for a train to go to Rustenburg. And this station master with his four friends beat me almost to death. 
because I had spoken in English. He said, you must speak in, in, in Afrikaans. And he called me Bobojan, uh, Kefa, all those names. And then they beat me, and the next thing I found myself, I was in hospital. And it was while I was unconscious, God said to me, Stephen, are you ready to forgive a white man? And I said, yes, Lord, I will forgive a white man. And when, as soon as I said that, like a big cement on my chest left me, and I regained consciousness. And the first person who visits me is a white nurse. And she says, what happened to you? I said, white people beat me. And she said, I hate my people. I hate my people. And she was crying for asking for forgiveness. But God used that because I wrote an English letter to that person who beat me up. This girl translated in Africans, sent it to that man. Seven months later, this man calls me to, to Pretoria, flew from Zimbabwe, meet him, and I said, now, who is this man? But then he says, you know, this letter when you wrote me, this letter is the one which reconciled my wife and me because we are going to divorce. But my wife forgave me because of your letter. And so we reconciled. And that man has become my best friend ever. My best friend. When I visit Pretoria, I stay with him. But God used a nasty incident, but to forgive. So I had to forgive my heart from the heart. And then God prepared me, preaching in 40,000 stadium in Harare. People coming forward. I'm praying for the sick. One woman jumped up. I'm healed. I'm healed. And I prayed for her. She accepted Jesus. And I said, God bless you. Come again tomorrow. I said, no, I've got one more problem. I said, what is your problem? He said, the story you've told tonight, you are my son. And that was my own mother. 49 years later, the same boy she dumped. Little did she know that this boy who preached in the White House in the United States, who preached to, uh, to George Bush, to Obama, who preached at the Pentagon in the uh, United States, who preached to many big universities. That boy she dumped became an asset in the kingdom of God. God is waiting for someone tonight. God is waiting for someone there in heaven. Samuel is waiting, whole Israel is waiting, South Africa is waiting for someone. They say, we will not sit down until that boy, that girl, that man arrives. And even God is waiting. Are you going to keep God waiting? Oh, tonight you said, God, I'm not enthusiastic about the Lord. I'm not passionate about the Lord. God, touch me today. Let your spirit rest upon me so that I may bless South Africa. I may be an asset in South Africa. If you are that man, that girl, say, God, I will not keep you waiting. Tonight is my night. Shall we stand?